Okay. So when you think of anxiety, what do you think about? What do you, what comes to your mind? Do you think of somebody, um, really stressed out, having a mental breakdown, um, somebody who can't handle, you know, um, deadlines and, uh, social anxiety of being in meetings, speaking up in front of a group, like pretty impairing things, right? Well, today I'm talking about something called high functioning anxiety. It's totally different because while it has a lot of things common with a quote unquote diagno diagnosable anxiety condition, it's not a diagnosable condition. And it's harder to identify because it doesn't have the requirement of clinical impairment that we see in anxiety disorders. And somebody with high functioning anxiety looks like they've got their stuff together typically, but it's still real and it's painful. So let's talk about it today. I'm Dr. Kit Slice, life coach and licensed psychologist, and I'm here to inspire all you perfectionists and anxious achievers who probably have high functioning anxiety um, to feel calm and confident uh, while holding clear boundaries. So with anxiety in general, some um often we do see impairment in folks. Um, the National Institute of Mental Health data shows that about one in five U.S. adults have a diagnosable mental health condition at any given time, but so many more go undiagnosed. And further, it seems that having a mental health condition at some point in someone's life is actually the norm, not the exception. So if you resonate with anxiety or any of these other um mental health disorders like depression or PTSD or anything like that, you are not alone. Um, definitely, if you think that you do have a mental health disorder, please talk to your primary care physician so that you can rule out any medical consider considerations, things like a thyroid disorder or a vitamin deficiency or any number of other things that can mimic mental health conditions or cause them even. So um, I do want to look at, actually, I'm going to grab Maybe. Yes. I'm going to grab my uh, pocket. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. We call it the DSM for short. This is the fifth edition. This is the, for better or worse, the Bible of diagnosing folks. And I'm going to pull it out because I just want to go through what the diagnosable anxiety disorders are. Page 115 in my handy dandy shortcut book here. What do we have? So we have a separation anxiety disorder. This is something that we're really seeing more um, in that early childhood um, stages. Um, selective mutism is when it becomes really difficult to speak in social situations or really failure to speak in social situations. Also, again, something that we're typically seeing in kiddos. And then we have specific phobias. So these are things... Um, they could be a phobia on a particular kind of animal or insect, something in nature like heights or storms. Um, getting um, shots is also one or just uh, phobias to needles or medical procedures. It could be situational, so getting on an airplane. Um, and the thing about it is that the, there's really intense fear or anxiety that's out of proportion to the situation. Then we have a social anxiety disorder, which is also kind of a phobia. Um, then we have panic disorder where folks are having panic attacks. Um, and then they're also fearing the um, actual um, uh, recurrence of the panic attack itself. So just because you have a panic attack doesn't mean that you have panic disorder. We can have panic attacks for all sorts of reasons. Doesn't mean we have a mental health condition. Okay. Um, although it could. Um, agoraphobia is another anxiety disorder where um, we're really being afraid of being out in an open space and not being able to escape the situation. Um, and then we have generalized anxiety disorder. And this is the one that high functioning anxiety probably looks like the most, but the difference is that we are not having the um, 
clinically significant uh, distress or impairment in some domain of our life. So it could be in relationships, it could be at work um, or other just areas of functioning where the anxiety is preventing us from functioning um, to our full capacity. But what we see in generalized anxiety disorder is things like excessive anxiety and worry, and it's lasting for a specified period of time. Um, and it's really difficult to control the worry. And then we're seeing um, other areas or ways that the anxiety is impacting us. It could be making us restless. It could making us be making us really tired because it is fatiguing to be worrying that much. It could make it really hard to concentrate and feeling like our mind is really going blank quite a bit. It can cause ears of irritability. It can cause muscle tension that's so extreme that it's requiring separate medical attention. Um, and it can also cause things like insomnia or sleep disturbances. Okay. So with, um, so I went through those things just because I describe, describe something that might sound like you doesn't mean that you have a diagnosable mental health condition, big caveat there, but I wanted to just kind of lay out some of the anxiety disorders um, and also talk about how, even though with high functioning anxiety, the person may not be experiencing impairment and they may be able to function well in the world and they may not find the anxiety subjectively so distressing that they feel like that they need treatment for it. Um, but sometimes the high functioning anxiety can turn into a generalized anxiety or even something we would call like an adjustment disorder, okay? Um, or it can also lead to depression or other mental health conditions as well. So how else might you know if you have high functioning anxiety? So one big thing is that it, it looks like you've got your stuff together on the outside. You seem cool, calm, collected. You've got, you know, um, it looks like you're organized. It looks like you're doing all these things and hitting achievements and reaching goals and, um, you know, coordinating your life. But on the inside, you're struggling with that worry that we mentioned. Um, possibly one or a few of those other symptoms. Although if you have a couple of them, um, I would recommend talking to a psychologist or your doctor about that. Um, I also see a lot in folks with high functioning anxiety, we see a lot of people pleasing, perfectionism and procrastination, okay? The pea soup, <laughs> okay? We might also see folks with high functioning anxiety we might also see um, imposter phenomenon, and I'll talk about that in another video. Um, toxic productivity or this fear of being bored. Um, in today's world, there's just, we are inundated with things that are overstimulating our dopamine um, responses in our brain, things like being on a screen all the time, social media. It's just... Um, we're getting overboarded with that. And what happens is that we're, it's almost like an addiction. We have so much dopamine going for us that when we don't have that stimulation, we feel uncomfortable at being at a slow pace. Okay. And this is something that we also see in folks with ADHD. But if you don't have ADHD, it's actually not ADHD. It's just this um, conditioning that we've experienced with our through our environment. OK, um, with a high functioning anxiety, you might be feeling like your brain is turning on at night when you try to go to sleep. Um, this can also be with the generalized anxiety as well. And the reason for that is because if you are high functioning and you're doing a lot in your life, um, and especially if you're like filling your time with a lot of stuff, there's not white space for your brain to just. calm down and do its thing there's always our brains are there's always this sort of um, mental chatter that we have going in our brains and that stuff is important it's um we are processing emotions and data and information with that mental chatter so if you're not giving yourself that white space to do that guess what when you try to go to sleep your brain's going to uh capitalize on that opportunity and not let you sleep so then we also have um, just focusing on really small details, it could be almost obsessively um, focusing on worst case scenarios. You might even begin to feel depressed, as I mentioned, it can lead to that. Um, and it can make making decisions and st or starting tasks. I mentioned that procrastination feel really hard. So where does high functioning anxiety come from? Well, we have... Um, 
it could be that we had high expectations in our childhood. I think schools a lot, it's a culture of, hey, you're not valued in the system if you're not getting good grades. So perform, perform, perform. Okay, so it could be even just from that. Or it could be from our parents. Maybe they had high expectations from us. Um, and I also want to just draw the distinction here at this point between overachieving um, and high achieving. So there's the overachieving where we're having the anxiety associated with achievement. And then there's folks who are high achieving who don't necessarily have anxiety. And those are distinct, right? Um, but the roots of high function anxiety. So if it comes from your parents, it could be um, that they had high expectations from you, or it could also be that they had anxiety themselves. And so that leads to, it could be a genetic component or if we are raised in environments where um, somebody has anxiety and they don't cope effectively with it, we often take on anxiety or learn, basically learn anxiety from that experience. Now it's different. If your parents um, had anxiety and coped well with it, you probably didn't take it on, okay? Which is another plug for getting treatment if you are a parent, does not pass it on to your kids. Learning how to cope is gonna also help your kids, okay? So, um, other places that hey, high functioning anxiety can come from, even if you haven't been an anxious person your entire life, didn't have the predisposition, predisposition to it, didn't feel like you were always trying to reach some milestone. If you experience a great amount of success in a short period of time, that can also trigger high functioning anxiety because all of a like, sudden like, oh man, oh boy, oh boy, there's a lot to do and how am I going to do it? And you start um, almost depending on the anxiety as a way to cope with it all because anxiety can keep us very activated and there, there's this activating component of anxiety. And so it becomes, well, I'm going to come back to this, <laughs> but anyways, that can cause it. Um, so with all of the above, we what we're developing though is a habit of anxiety, even if there is a genetic component. And then the other thing to keep in mind, for some of us, anxiety causes uh, avoidance. We don't want to deal with a thing. Let's put our head in the ground kind of you know, and ignore it all. With high-functioning anxiety, it's the opposite. We are approaching situations again and again and again, even though they cause us anxiety. So um, it's mobilizing. And um, if we achieve success in response to okay, I was anxious and it got me to do all these things. It becomes this positive reinforcement of almost like, oh, I need the anxiety in order to perform when guess what? <laughs> That's not true. That is a story that your brain is telling yourself. There are other ways to be mobilized without feeling anxious all the time. So um, to find tools to work with anxiety, you can check out my videos on cultivating calm or setting boundaries, um, or I'm going to be making some more videos on a series in high functioning anxiety. Um, but for today, I'm going to give you a few tips. So um, we're going to talk about ways to reframe your anxiety. And the reason why we're, the goal is to reframe the anxiety, not, not to, but it's not to not feel the anxiety. And this comes from um, an acceptance and commitment therapy. They talk about dead people's goals. Dead people's goal is like, I don't want to feel anxious. That is a dead person's goal. If you're alive, you're going to feel anxiety. It's a normal part of just being human. So instead of trying to eliminate the anxiety, we're talking about reframing the anxiety. And this can also be helpful for a variety of anxiety actually disorders, not just in high fun functioning anxiety. Um, but um, we're going to talk about some reframes for our high functioning anxiety folks today. So reframe number one is that anxiety is my protector. So I've talked about how um, the anxiety kind of serves you in some way. But the other thing about anxiety, and I've talked about this in other videos, is that stress, which is has a relationship to anxiety, is an adaptive response. It is your body responding to a perceived threat in the environment. Anxiety, what we're doing, the threat is like something that we're thinking about. Okay, so it's still response to a threat in a way. Um, so the stress response is an evolutionary response that is literally designed to protect us. 
if we did not experience stress in response to a threat, we would not make it very far. Because what the stress response does to us is it mobilizes us to fight or flight or might cause us to shut down so that we are not um, looking like a tasty, squirmy meal to a predator. Okay, so it is a survival mechanism. Remember I mentioned anxiety is different than stress because it's our body's response to a fear that we are imagining that isn't actually in the present environment, but the symptoms can look identical. And with stress, the physical symptoms go away once the stressor is gone. With anxiety, the symptoms linger. But the thing about anxiety, it's that reframe. It's if you can reframe it as, hey, my body is trying to protect me, just remembering this can put some space between you and the anxiety. And it also keeps you from like um, totally buying into what's the story that the anxiety is telling you at that moment, okay? So that's reframe number one. Remember that anxiety is my protector, but I don't always have to feel it intensely all the time, <laughs> okay? Reframe number two is... What's the upside to your anxiety? Um, remember that there is that mobilizing factor that anxiety can serve us some, in some ways. But we think about what anxiety does is it really gets our bodies activated. So if you think about that stress response, again, one thing that happens when, we're, when we are feeling that response to a threat is that our body gears us to... Um, be more um, attuned to our environment in some ways, not attuned in other ways. But one thing that we might see with anxious people, a lot of them are attuned to their internal and external cues. So if I'm a highly anxious person, I might be really in tuned to my heart rate and might be really attuned to also um, the way that person is saying something. And that could be a good thing because if I can hear like some emotional nuance and what they're saying that somebody without anxiety isn't going to pick up on, I might be able to develop a deeper relationship with that person. If I can pick up on other things in my environment that need attending to, that might be a good thing because then I can attend to them and not lead to like some disaster with the water heater that I averted because I noticed some little thing of a noise or something in my environment, right? So there's an upside to anxiety. And then the reframe number three is tapping into our anxiety. So we've talked so much about how there's this mobilizing feature to anxiety. And what you can do is that you can tap into the anxiety and direct it to your purpose. So I do a lot of values work with my clients for this reason. Because we, if we are anxious and mobilized and we're just, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, and this. It's like, oh, look at all these to-do items that I crossed off. I am high functioning. But it's like, how many of those to-do items were the most important thing for you today, <laughs> right? So when we know what our purpose is, what our values are, what our top goals are, we can funnel our energy into that purpose more intently and then be aware of like, okay, I don't have to finish everything I'm on to-do list today, even if the anxiety is making me feel like more still mobilized. We can say, here's what was most important to me based on my values and my goals. And then I'm going to practice letting go of the, less, of the rest. And so this is going to prevent that burnout and fatigue that we see with chronic stress and over time, high functioning anxiety that's not being managed well. So think of anxiety as your double-edged sword for you high functioners out there. You can distance yourself from the difficult parts of it and then embrace the parts of it that are serving you. So to find out more tools to work with anxiety, check out my videos on cultivating calm, setting boundaries, or the rest of the videos coming soon in this series on high functioning anxiety. And I hope this video is helpful. Bye for now.